experience of being out and trying to raise capital and how exciting that is. Who loves that part of entrepreneurship? No, exactly, no one. Um, yeah, that's tough, it's really tough. And it's essential. So today we're going to be talking about some of the key things that you can do to make that not only a great experience, but a successful experience. And one that completely turns the tables. And so you're no longer the one out doing the chasing, but they're chasing you. Okay, so uh, buckle up your running shoes and get ready for that. That'll be super fun. Um, but before I do that, let me first just uh, welcome San Diablo. Hang on, where do I see Scott? Okay, oh, there we go. Okay, let's welcome San, San Diablo Churros. Yeah. I love that you bring cowbell. As if churros weren't enough. I mean, you can't get enough cowbell and you can't get enough San Diablo churros. That's awesome. Okay, um, and we're also really, really thrilled to have the team from Workman Nidegger here as sponsors. Where are they at? No, oh, they're, they're hiding. They're not here yet. Okay, we'll welcome them in a few minutes, okay? Um, welcome to RevU. Once a month, every first Thursday of the month, you are all invited to be here. Uh, people in the audience today, in case you don't know, are entrepreneurs, uh, future entrepreneurs, uh, failed entrepreneurs, which are my favorite ones because they're the ones that are going to be the most successful on the next one. Do you know that's actually true? And it's so good to see you. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. And uh, that is actually the best predictor of success for entrepreneurship is having done it before, whether you failed or succeeded, which is interesting. So um, we welcome each one of you. We also have funders in the audience. Uh, we've got folks who help businesses grow in many different ways, which is near and dear to our hearts because that's what we do at RevRoad. So we help entrepreneurs grow their business and keep it while they do. All right, uh, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce our very own Seth and Bart, who are going to be leading today's session. And as I do that, I'd like to have the opportunity to just introduce them. Uh, Bart is one of the founders here at Imagine Learning, and I'm so grateful for him. He is an incredible leader. What did I say? I did it again. It's like almost every time. Okay, so Rev Road is our 10th business, <laughs> and our most recent exit was Imagine Learning. So my apologies, my bad. If I do that again, I do it with affection. Um, so Rev Road. He's one of the great founders here at RevRoad, and uh, Bart is from uh, Texas, but uh, currently resides in Colorado. Uh, he's the CF CFO here, and he helps us help these companies grow, and especially he oversees the capital uh, hub here at RevRoad. And as you know, raising capital is really crucial. Um, he has a great background. His, his experience as an economist uh, is his formal training. In addition to that, he's a, a several times successful serial entrepreneur. He's been a CFO several times. He's been a CEO. He's been an operational executive in many capacities. Uh, he's been a VC, and uh, we're thrilled to have him here today. I also have the opportunity to, invite, to uh, introduce Seth. Seth is our data scientist here at, uh, at RevRoad. He does what? Data analyst. A data analyst, who is also a scientist. Um, one of the great things about our team is we definitely make sure we get it right. Uh, and, and for me, it's always the second time, so I appreciate your patience. Uh, but I'm a, I'm a fast learner. So he's our, he's our data analyst. Um, I do think of him as a scientist, and he does all kinds of analysis for our companies. Uh, and market analysis, he'll do individual competitive analysis, product analysis, pricing analysis, all kinds of things that help contribute to the growth and success of these businesses. So. Um, with that, let's all welcome Bart and Seth to the stage. Okay, thank you, Darren. Darren, not Daryl. Donald. That's my brother, Darren. Your other brother, Daryl. Okay, thank you, everyone, for coming. We have an exciting presentation. What, what gets Seth and I excited as, as financial analysts and... Uh, we have a lot of uh, charts, charts and graphs, graphs kind of eye candy that, that uh, from, from, from which our, our, our data, the numbers that we're, we're looking at all the time are turned into pictures. We hope to paint a picture, a broad picture of this very important area of raising capital. I want to say one more thing about Seth. Seth is exhibit A at RevRoad of what we founders do is hire someone 
way smarter than you and turn them loose. And so you're going to see that in, in Seth here today. But uh, let's go ahead and get started with our, our presentation on getting investors to chase you. Okay, there it goes. So the number one thing that gets investors excited about what you're doing, it's not ideas. A lot of people really, really fall in love with some sort of idea, and this is what they want to see happen. And that is a huge red flag. What we're really looking for is something called traction. Traction in a company tells you how, you're, how, um, how much your product is being used, how much people like your product, what is your customer loyalty. Okay? It is the precursor to revenues. It's the precursor to success in these companies because it shows, it demonstrates, listen, we've got a problem that hurts a lot of people that we can monetize that they are already using. And you present that to an investor and they will keep calling you until you take their money. That is what investors are looking for and that is the best way to succeed and to raise money with uh, investors. That's all you need is to be able to demonstrate this traction. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, everyone, for coming. That's our presentation. Are there any questions? <laughs> That's really the, the, the main thing right there is traction. But let's move forward with, since we have a little bit of time before lunch, with uh, getting into some of these eye candy charts. Again, this is, we're going to look at comprehensively at much less important things than traction. Keep that in mind. <laughs> the main important thing is traction. So this chart tells a story from recent history, some of you, this you might call this ancient history, started in 1995. Uh, Netscape did an IPO, the advent or the commercialization of the internet browser, starts the dot-com uh, craze and boom, followed by a dot-com bust. But uh, leading up there to, you, th this is venture capital spending in the United States. Uh, surpassed 100 billion for the first time in the year 2000 and we haven't been close since Y2K spending and uh, some other things led up to that, uh, involved in that boom, and, and then sure enough, all bubbles must burst, and it popped, and this was followed by a recession, and then 9-11 happened in 01, and that exasperated the downturn, and venture capital spending stayed in that dearth for about a decade. The good news is we're coming out of that dearth, and if we were to show 2018 on the, on the chart, uh, 2018, first half was 57 billion, so we'll probably surpass 100 billion in venture capital investment in the year 2018. Okay, so what this is showing here is something amazing that happened. For the first time ever in the second quarter of this year, the United States was not number one in venture capital. China surpassed the United States. Not only that, you can see here that um, other markets in, in the world are, sh are coming out as emerging markets. They're showing a lot more opportunities available. Those emerging markets, um, as they're getting more of the infrastructure in place, there's a lot of uh, profitable enterprises that are possible. So what we see here is the world on the world stage, um, we're in the US going to have to compete a lot more for that venture, those, those venture funds. That's, that's what we're looking at here. That's what this is, is the US isn't number one anymore. Not only that, Venture capitalists are changing their strategy. Rather than going for a, a, a larger portfolio of companies that, are, that uh, you know, are early stage and you know, one will be fantastic and take off and the rest will be kind of um, you know, lost along the way or a little bit less successful, they are looking for that one, for that unicorn company. Investing a lot of money. We're not talking about like several mil a couple million dollars up front at the beginning. They're... Um, they're investing tens of millions of dollars into these companies at a later stage. The strategy of what they're looking for as far as funding is changing. So something that's not changing is what VCs typically spend their money on. That uh, dark bottom uh, base there, 40% pretty much year in, year out of uh, software, software as a service related types of companies. And you add in uh, biotech and some other IT hardware, spending, and this is traditionally what VCs spend their money on. What's interesting about this slide is this section here, this, this other bar, it's expanding, it's, it's getting bigger. And so is that blockchain, cryptocurrency, some other disruptive technology that we have yet to hear about? 
it could very well be. Could very well be that some of you are working on some of these new disruptive technologies. Yeah. So the the product offering market is is even changing a lot. Right. Um, this shows kind of uh, some of the same things we saw earlier. The total number of deals that you're seeing is decreasing, but the actual money being spent is about the same. They're making um, larger and fewer investments than they have before. This is that early stage seed and angel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the seed and angel funds too, especially. So, so even in these, it's, it's a lot of like picking racehorses rather than you know, in, investing in the whole, uh, the whole track, I guess. Yeah, so this is a, a way to tell the same story graphically, geographically, if you will. So it's, uh, if, if it's a little bit of, a, uh, of an eye strain, 40% of the, of the deals in second quarter of 2018, and this is pretty much, th these numbers hold true for every quarter for the past decade or so, and we expect them to continue to hold true. 40% of the deals, over 60% of the deal value, the dollar spent, comes from the West Coast, and specifically in that narrow neck of land where my wife is from, <laughs> Silicon Valley, um, is, is the heart of, of all of this spending. Quite a bit of spending going on also on the upper half of the eastern seaboard in the Boston and New York areas. Next slide. So th this, this shows, shows it a slightly different way in terms of uh, the, the relative size of the bubbles, the um, size of the ball here. And so big ones in San Jose, San Francisco, some others out east, a uh, little, little bit going on here in, in Provo Salt Lake area. Um, if, if we were to show this, um, not by number of deals, but by dollar size, the, the coverage of the ball emanating from Silicon Valley would literally cover over half of the continental United States. That's how much capital is flowing into Silicon Valley. This says the same thing. California dominates in terms of VC investment coming into uh, one particular area. And in, in fact, it's so much that all 49 states combined, plus the uh, District of Columbia, do not equal what California takes in year in, year out in, in venture capital investment. You can see Utah at the far right here, number 12 with um, a little over 3 billion. And that's nothing to sneeze at. So Utah is coming on. This is the way I like prefer, I prefer showing it. To me, as an analyst, showing it per capita makes more sense. And uh, that being the case, I mean, Utah's in the top four. That, that's not only nothing to sneeze at, that's, that's incredible. We are right behind New York in per capita VC funding. Um, Massachusetts takes California and per cap over California in per capita, which is kind of interesting. But uh, the, the startup environment that we have here in Utah is actually one of the best in the world. So that's, that's something to be really, really excited about and really Yeah, great ecosystem to. being developed right here in, in Utah Valley with entrepreneurs, with students, programmers, designers, uh, a, a legal profession, accountants. It takes, it takes the whole ball of wax, which Silicon Valley has perfected, and we're seeing that duplicated now in areas like Austin, Texas, like Provo, like, uh, what do they call it, Research Triangle in, uh, in North Carolina. So, so this, this chart, chart uh, is, is, is very, very colorful. colorful. It just it shows, shows this continuing trend. trend. It's, it's a little dated, 2014, but it's, it's, this trend has, has, has actually magnified in the last few years of later stage deals taking a greater and greater portion of the overall pie of VC spending. There's, you, you can barely see in blue down at the bottom the seed investment that makes up the, the total universe of venture capital spending in the US. It's a sliver, and that's, that's, that's not great for early stage startups, but there are ways to overcome that. So this, uh, uh, just another way to, to say the same thing. Um, when I was running a, a VC fund from about 98 to 2003, this Series A bar would actually extend before inception. You have a couple of bright engineers and a good idea, and they could get Series A funding. That, that time is over, and it's, it's not going to return, I don't believe. So today what we're seeing is the, the, the seed comes on very early, and the Series A comes on much, much later. And so even before seed funding is available, there has to be a way of funding your startup. So what are those? So with all these numbers, right, 
hundreds of billions of dollars, venture capital is the best place to find investment for our startups. Yeah, so as a former VC, I would agree with that. You, you got to go to, oh, maybe not. Uh, yeah, so currently startup stage VC spending is less than five hundredths of a percent of who is funding startups currently. So here's another way to show just how small that 0.05% uh, uh, is. Let's say the, the universe of college basketball players represents startups that are looking for venture capital. So there are about 900 and some universities across the United States that, that play college basketball, D1, D2, D3, NIAI, 12 to 14 players per team. So almost 12,000 college basketball players in any given year who are all dreaming to get paid to play this game, to get drafted into the NBA. Only um, about uh, uh, 60 actually get drafted, two rounds, 30 teams. Another dozen or so might luck out and take a spot of a veteran who's hurt or something. So very small percentage of those college basketball players actually make it to the next level. And yet they are 12 times more likely to make it to that next level than a startup is to get venture capital funding. That's how small 0.05% is. Now in the US, we have over half a million startups per year. So those numbers are a little bit bigger, the like total number that gets VC funding, but it's not something to hang your hat on. In fact, it's not even something to depend on or really go, go for. On average, each startup um, in the US of these, these uh, you know, 565,000 startups, uh, they, each one raises uh, about 75,000, a little bit more, a little bit less. Okay? A lot of that comes from, uh, a lot of that funding is federal SBA loans, right? The, those average about $150,000 a piece. Uh, there's only about 100,000 of them total, so maybe one in five startups, or uh, this isn't even all startups, this is small businesses to a large degree, are getting these loans, right? So um, the amount that actually typically comes out of the pocket of the founder is about $46,000. So about half of the money for the startup comes from that. Um, and then this we include, because this is kind of interesting to see what's going on here. Crowdfunding um, only currently uh, covers about uh, $5.5 billion total. That's about $7,000 per campaign that's put on crowdfunding camp places. But it's growing at about 150% per year. So this is not an insignificant amount currently, and it is growing faster than any other source. And it's projected to even be greater than VC funding if these trends continue. So this is kind of what it looks like, where your, where your fundings come from. This is, again, aggregate numbers, total numbers here. The vast majority of what's what's being funded, what's being plunked down, that's coming from the pockets of the investors, pockets of the founders. Okay, friends and family, that can sometimes be precarious uh, in raising, but that is a greater source, or you'll have a much higher chance getting uh, money from friends and family than you will from a VC, than you will from a lot of other sources, right? This is where those, uh, this is kind of how the balance looks when it comes to current startup funding. Yeah, so said another way, graphically, the, the green shaded areas, both personal and 5Fs, which is your, your personal network in essence, that's 95% of all funding for startups is in those personal networks. And we're going to get into uh, uh, some of the details there a little bit more, but we'll just point out that purple VC slice, it's a razor thin line. That's the, again, the 0.05%. It so literally looks like the yellow one has a shadow. That's the VC line is the shadow of the yellow. Yeah, your triangle. odds are much better of uh, if you were playing golf, uh, landing in the green than uh, trying to go for that purple, at least in the very early stages of your startup. So, um, when, so then not looking at VC funding, but other investors, we've got this great idea and we go out there and we pitch it to investors, right? Sure, you have to have an idea to, to pitch, no? Ideas without traction are worthless. They're a dime a dozen. Um, I would never bank in any given idea no matter how much I like it or no matter how much I came up with it. Because um, without that market validation, the idea is pointless. There are uh, lots of products out there that are way better than the product on the market that currently most people are buying but that isn't 
being purchased for lots of different reasons, whether it's marketing or whether it's actually design or whether they de how they deployed it or it's a failure in the way that they were funded. There's a lot of great products out there that aren't working. And so the only real way to identify if it's a good idea or not is if the market verifies it's a good idea, if you have that traction, that stickiness, um, that fan club for what you're trying to do. Okay. Uh, so, then, so then to get these customers, right, to get this traction, we then go out and we build, we build this product for them so we can get these, these customers. Yeah, so now you're beyond idea stage, so yeah, you gotta have something to show an investor if you're trying to raise capital, no? So as it turns out, you wanna start developing customers before you have an idea. In fact, the idea needs to come from the customers. In fact, before you have the idea, the problem the idea is addressed to needs to come from your customers. This is the best way to form a startup because by the time you hit that idea stage, you've got people, you have traction baked into this. You just need to ask them if they're gonna buy it or not. And if they say they will, ask them to buy it. That gives you that revenue, that gives you that traction, and that gives you the information, this gives you this whole iterative process you can go through to then continually improve your, um, your product, continually improve your customer development, continually improve that, that uh, cycle so that you have that golden word, traction. So you have that traction as you go. Putting traction first is the best way to get funding for, for any startup. Okay, so that makes sense, and this is uh, reminiscent of a great quote by uh, the poet Ralph Waldo Emerson who said, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. True or false? <laughs> Actually, it's false. <laughs> May have been true when he first said it, but it is absolutely not true today. But not to knock this great poet too much, here's another quick stanza of his. He said, and, and this relates to us as individuals as well as to startups. The purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. Similarly, the purpose of a startup is not to make money. That's a byproduct of starting up and starting up well and filling, filling needs that are, that are out there solving problems. Yeah, not a lot of people know this, but uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson totally lost his shorts in the mousetrap industry. <laughs> In his day, like he lost so much that. money. Oh yeah, it was. <laughs> okay. So, so this one must not be true. I've, I see a trend developing here. Uh, the, these assumptions. Absolutely right. Okay. Spend money to make money makes absolutely no spent sense. Nobody has ever got wrench by spending money. When we have money as kind of the outcome, we have the wrong goal in mind. Okay, so what we're trying to do is create real value, have some process that people truly get something meaningful from, and then in that process be able to capture some part of that value in the form of, of money, right? If cash is our goal, we're gonna miss our goal. If traction is our goal, that's, that's what's gonna happen. So even when it comes in the early stages, when you're doing your minimum viable product, when you're making your first you know, offering to the public or to, the, to your customers, it's not a world-changing solution. It's, in fact, the worst solution that you can come up with, you know, the resources that you have. But it's the best solution you can, for given what you have, to get that traction. Again, it's to demonstrate traction, not to actually accomplish or solve completely the problem that you've identified that you're doing. And that's... The, the, in, in raising capital or in looking in what your resources need to be, again, it's, it's traction first before all this other stuff. Once you have that, you have the momentum you need to go the rest of the way. Okay. It's one of my favorite quotes there about uh, nobody. <laughs> so then we need, uh, we need capital then, right? We need cash to some degree to build a product, right? Must be false like all the others. Okay, so this one's actually true. You do need resources to a large degree if you're gonna do, people won't work for free, not even you should work for free. We always encourage our, our, uh, our, our roadies to, to take, take salaries. But you don't need as much as you think. You don't need to be able to pay for everything, especially not up front or, or soon. And you don't need it as soon as you think because you can get really far in finding traction without even having a product and then the product that you do need at that point 
is not going to be nearly as expensive as you think is going to be. Yeah, so great quote there, last one. Uh, don't let money itself become the problem or the, or the pursuit of money. So in raising capital, this is typically what we have, right? We have this idea, um, so I need X amount of money. You see it on Shark Tank. I gotta, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for uh, $500,000 for 20% of my company. And it's, that's, that's what it is. This is how much, these are, this is what we're able to spend or what we're willing to give up in exchange for a certain amount of money so that we can then fund the rest of things and, and keep things going. When we go out and raise capital, we find uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that, especially in early stage funding, because like I said, a lot of these uh, institutional investors or even institutional uh, lenders aren't really going to uh, are really going to cut it. But there are ways of doing it, and you will find yourself eventually at the end. But it's not going to come in the way that you think, and it's going to be a lot. Stay stay on that slide, Seth. So uh, here's here's a little metaphor. This is the classic glass half full, glass half empty, right? What's another way you could look at this? <laughs> yeah, there's water in the glass, but as, a, as an entrepreneur looking for capital, you might say, why is the container twice as big as it needs to be? Whether it's half full or it's half empty, raise the amount of capital that you need to, and, and no more and no less. And so make this a very efficient process. And like this, this chart suggests, it's, it's an incredibly complicated process sometimes. It's never easy, no matter the source, whether it's venture capital or other sources you're raising this capital from, but raise the amount you need, build additional traction, then raise some more. Don't raise too much or, or too little to start. Drain this. I think a venture, capital would pro a venture capitalist would probably say that water is only living up to half of its potential. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're gonna go over how do you fund you know, pre-revenue activities before you have, how do you get that product or what resources you need? What is this, this kind of magic money out of nowhere? Where does it come from? Well, the first place it comes from is essentially just not spending money that you don't have. Even more important, delay the parts of the process it takes to build your MVP, right, to get to that product. Delay the parts that cost money. You'd be surprised what you can do before you get there. And then by the time you get there, you'll be surprised at what you need. A lot of the roadies that come on, when we're going through their books and looking at their expenses and stuff, they're almost embarrassed because they've got this massive, this massive expense at the top. And we go, OK, well, you know, what's this? How do we, what do we do with this? Oh, just we, we, we started wrong. <laughs> we spent all of that doing this one thing that turns out is completely irrelevant to what actually we ended up doing. And so by delaying those expenses, it might take longer, might be more complicated. It's definitely more painful, but it's going to be cheaper. And so you'll be able to get a lot further with a lot less. The other thing is most of the things you need to do to get to the point of traction, or at least um, before you need to start spending money on, on products, you can do part time. You don't need to quit a job that you have. That's a fantastic source of money and also a fantastic way of keeping food in your belly while you do the rest with your startup. Yeah, you are your best resource, your best asset right now. So uh, here's my pair of boots, and uh, this is a very special pair of boots. I'll tell you why in just a second, but this is the, the proverbial bootstrap. And so at RevRoad, we love entrepreneurs that come to us who have, who have bootstrapped, who have used their own resources, who have delayed uh, development, who have... Uh, found very creative ways to, uh, to preserve resources, to create additional resources, and uh, it, it involves a great deal of creativity. I bootstrapped these boots. Uh, found them at my local store in Colorado. One is size 13, one is size 14, and uh, I wear about a size 13 and a half, so on average they're perfect, <laughs> but uh, they were uh, $200 off. I, I bought them for $49. <laughs> True entrepreneur move right there. True story. Do you have anything broken that I can buy? <laughs> no, but one, one more point here. So if you, in, in the, the, the metaphor is that it's impossible to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but you're still asked to do it. I've found that when you're wearing these, if you're stuck in the mud, if you pull one foot and then pull your other bootstraps in stair-step fashion, that you can make progress. So this, um, the, the five Fs is something that was introduced to me by Brad Burtock. He is, did he come? Brad, are you out there? 
I don't think, I didn't see him come in or anything, but um, he's with uh, venturecapital.org. Um, and, uh, and so these are the, the first places to actually go for startup capital. The founders of your company, your family, fools, anyone who thinks your idea is really, really good, take money from them. That's a great source of funding. We say fools with love. <laughs> And, and, and uh, former friends, that's the last two Fs, right? Yeah, there. there are a lot of people that are not friends or family that might be that other, other kind of uh, the, the, the fool word. They laugh all the way to the bank in, in some cases. But uh, great source to, to go to expand your own personal resources, your job, your savings, your credit cards, your home equity line of credit. Go to them. Give them the opportunity. Uh, we, we've done that at RevRoad. We're not real likely to work with a startup if, if a startup comes to us and we say, have you gone to your network? Do you have skin in the game besides the, you know, burning the midnight oil and, and doing that? If they say, no, we're not going to risk our, our uh, brother-in-law's money or we don't want to go to our neighbor even though they're a high net worth individual, um, we're, we're not sure that that uh, they really believe in their idea or their, the, the problem that they're solving after all. So that's something that, that we specifically look for at RevRoad here. Pitch competitions. You guys live in a great place for this because there are a lot of pitch competitions in Utah for startups. This is a pitch competition that we ran. It was won by Journeyfront, one of the uh, roadies we have. They won several pitch competitions, and the money from that has been able to, they've been able to stretch it further than I thought it could go. It was amazing. They won before they were part of Revo. Yeah. But they're still, yeah, they did, before they were part of Revo. But it was yeah. that money that you, they used as funding um, and became a major thing. So it's free money, basically, right? You're not taking on debt. You're not issuing, uh, you're not issuing equity. It takes time. I mean, any competition you enter, you're not likely to win. Um, but uh, everything that you do, even if you don't make anything, it's great marketing as well. So these are definitely, I think that's definitely a part of, uh, of what you want to go for, what you want to look for. Okay, grants are another source of funding. Uh, free money and for, for all intents and purposes. They're, these are available from uh, federal, state, local government entities for a variety of reasons. They're trying to encourage uh, space exploration or feeding the uh, housing the homeless, feeding hungry, uh, lots of different kinds of projects that they're giving away grant money to for-profit startups, among others. Um, Nonprofit foundations have, have their purposes for which they give, they award grants, and so do corporations. So uh, a quick Google search, uh, grants nationwide, statewide, local here, will, will yield a lot of information. It takes a lot of time, there's a lot of competition for these, but it is a source. Okay, um, yeah, grants, uh, if you write them yourself, they're really long and really difficult. If you hire somebody to do it, uh, it's somewhere between about $2,500 per hour with the amount of hours they put in, it's somewhere between about $300 and $3,000. You can usually apply to several grants with one application, the multiple, but it has to be a really good fit for what they're giving the money away for, and it has to be a really compelling uh, solution, really compelling offer that you have for them, otherwise you're not gonna get them. These are difficult to get, but definitely worth at least looking into. So we also have a, uh, oh. Hold, hold on, Mark? There's a federal register of federal grants, and it's, it's like voluminous. It's federalgrants.org, I believe, yeah. or gov. Unfunded, yet no one looks them up and sees them. Hmm. So while you talk about Googling them, if you look at that federal register, there is a grant for just about everything, like Mark said, and they have to go unclaimed. OK, thank you, Mark. Federal register of grants, if you couldn't hear that. Uh, yeah. And what did you say the website is? Uh, it's federalgrants.gov. There's federal also a couple grants. other organizations that have curated the grants in a much more user-friendly way. Okay, But uh, you just search for federal grants or state grants. There's Good. lots of stuff. I know companies that, I mean, that's their business model is basically find grants, and then they do whatever they have to to qualify for them, and then that's their business yeah. that they run. Basically, the grant holder is their customer. Okay. So there's a lot of stuff you can do there. Um, P2P lending. This is something that came into vogue about uh, 10 years ago. It's like, uh, let's, uh, and, and so what it is basically, it's a bunch of people that pool their money and, and then they collectively fund a bunch of small businesses or different ventures. It's a lot like bank lending. They can take a little bit more risk than banks can typically, and so they're a little bit more generous to startups, uh, but the terms of repayment and stuff like that are very similar to a bank and very rigid. 
Uh, micro lending is oftentimes subsidized and there are smaller loan amounts, so they're not always the best fit. But if you're a smaller startup or you need less money, they might be a good fit to, to go that way. Yeah, lendingclub.com is an example of a peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, crowdfunding, lots of examples. Uh, the GoFundMe, Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Um, just uh, access to, uh, as Seth pointed out, this is growing, what'd you say, 150% per year? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's, it's not equity. You do have commitments that you make though, and if, if, if you don't deliver on, on whatever that might be that's helping you attract that funding, you instantly have uh, dozens or hundreds or, or more people that are not fans of your company. So yeah. that's, that's a risk of crowdfunding. It's, kind of, it's a double-edged sword. You don't yeah. want to start your company with a thousand angry customers. Yeah. So then there's purchase order financing, which is basically using a purchase order from a customer as a collateral um, on the loan. So essentially you transfer your purchase order to another entity. They give you uh, the, the amount of cash for it. And then as they collect it from your customer, they then uh, you know, take all of that, plus they take you know, their, their uh, interest rate on that and then give to you anything left over after that. So it's a way of liquidating purchase orders early. Uh, it's great for working capital. Uh, you can't really get it for long-term loans or for very much, uh, you, you can't really get it for any more than the, uh, the, the, what the purchase order is worth, what they're actually ordering. Yeah, so factoring is another way for startups to get access to capital. And this is after you have uh, you know, gone through that, that left side of the, of the chart here and accessing capital, including financial capital and human capital to launch and bootstrap and get started. But uh, the, on, the, on the right side of the chart are some ways that uh, once you maybe get a little bit further along with early traction, early sales, so factoring is simply selling an account receivable. You've sold some goods, services to a customer and uh, they have a payment coming in the future and you take that and sell it to a factoring company discounted by a factor which is where the name gets its its name from you might uh, have to discount it by 10 20 percent to get the money right now that factoring company then owns that receivable they collect from your customer um, vendor financing is essentially uh, payment terms for your vendors. Vendors are often very willing to do this because they want to keep you in business so you'll sell more of their stuff. Um, and so essentially it's, they'll, they'll usually give you a 30 day grace period to pay and then a lot of them will have financing terms, late fees, that sort of thing and it's simply calling them and saying, hey, could we please delay payments in order to ease our cash flow so that we can continue growing the way that we're growing and continue buying more and more of your stuff. Uh, vendors are often very happy to do that if they see the kind of growth that uh, a lot of startups see. Yeah, and everybody's probably heard the term 210 net 30. You get a discount if you pay early rather than trying to extend the terms. So a 2% discount if you pay within 10 days. Otherwise, the net is due within 30 days. Our favorite way of, of funding a startup is through revenue, customer financed sales. Just running your business, collecting that, that revenue, reinvest it back into your company, doesn't cost you any interest, doesn't cost you any points on the, on the cap table for equity, um, and it, it establishes a best way to establish that traction that we keep talking about. Here's uh, some other really great ways to fund your company, some of my personal ones. Very outside the box thinking. Entrepreneurs are really well known for that, and these are some great examples that I love from it. In 2008, Airbnb had $20,000 in credit card debt. That's how they financed their early startup. This is not recommended. <laughs> this is not a good source of financing, but that's what they did. And so they were thinking, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to go, we don't want to consolidate debts. We don't want to release any more equity. How on earth are we going to pay this off? I know, let's sell cereal. This was during the 2008 election. This is what they sold here. They just repackaged Captain Crunch and Cheerios and they sold it for $40 per box. And anyone want to buy, pay 40 bucks for a box of cereal? Yeah, I wouldn't either. But the national news picked up on it. They ended up selling out on their first day, selling 1,000 boxes after costs, making $30,000 and were able to wipe out that credit card debt. And these are collector's <laughs> items. Those are probably worth uh, a multiple of 40 bucks a box now, if, if they didn't eat it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so another uh, uh, well-known example is Fred Smith with FedEx in the early days uh, when he's getting this company going out of uh, uh, Nashville. He was short by... Uh, quite a bit to meet payroll. He took $5,000 to the blackjack tables and he won. 
So he had $27,000 to barely meet his payroll that week. Not we a recommended had, source. Yeah, Again, don't, recommend that. <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> but it is creative outside the box thinking. So uh, the boring company, they needed to buy these gigantic drills in order to make uh, that, that, that drill tunnels um, underground. Uh, it cost tens of millions of dollars. Um, so they decided to uh, sell flamethrowers. This was Elon Musk's idea. $500 a piece, they sold 20,000 of them. Uh, again, I love entrepreneurs. It's really, really creative bucks. stuff. But uh. <laughs> So this last one is another way to fund your startup here. Um, I'm going to let you guess how we feel about it here. <laughs> it's called an initial coin offering. Yeah, so ICO for short. Uh, it's trying to, in essence, uh, uh, duplicate or, or combine an IPO. Uh, through through more traditional means with with crowdfunding and uh, obviously from the skull and bones we are not recommending this. It is something that maybe one day could get some some credibility as as blockchain technology as as cryptocurrency advances. But right now the SEC is uh, is is finding that a good portion of these are just pure fraud. Just take people's money and then you never hear from them again. Um, but it's something to to keep your eye on. Someday they might be legitimate, but they're not currently. Um, right. They're, like I said, they're not being registered as securities, and there's no legal reason whatsoever why these are exempt to those security laws. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just kind of funny. The reason why we wait so long to get institutional financing like this is two major problems. The first one is undervaluation. So say you have a company, it's worth about $2 million. Um, someone offers you $100,000 for 20% of your company and you take that. How do you feel about that, Bart? Uh, it doesn't sound like a great deal for me if I'm the entrepreneur. And, and just to be clear here, so now we're moving on kind of these outside the box uh, ways of raising capital. We're on to the traditional um, uh, uh, institutional uh, money raises, capital raises. So in this case, I've undervalued my company and uh, I've I've cheated myself in essence. Cheated yourself out of $300,000 or 15% of your company. Yeah. But overvaluation. This one isn't a problem whatsoever because I'm getting so much more from my company than it's actually worth. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, yeah, so this one, uh, you, now, now you're cheating your neighbor, your, your friends and family, whomever you've gotten to invest. But uh, perhaps just as important is, is this goes back to uh, uh, some of my experience in the early 2000s when we're coming off of that bubble and it's bursting and we're sliding downhill and uh, there, there are what are called down rounds uh, and a down round is a lower valued uh, capital raise than the prior round. If you raised money at 10 million in the prior round and now you're raising at five, that's a, that's a warning signal. That sometimes signals a death spiral for a startup. So you want to avoid that and not take that early money at, at too high of a price, too high of a valuation. Not sometimes, that usually, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a, yeah, it's, you're, you're doomed basically if you get too overvalued. It's yeah. almost impossible to recover. This is the other reason why we wait for institutional financing. Premature scaling. Premature scaling means you have revenue growth. You're increasing the amount of money that you're making. You're increasing the total number of customers you have and the total volume of transactions that you have. And that you are developing new products faster than ever before. Your product is looking better than it ever has. How does that sound, Bart? Sounds great. That's why we're in business, isn't it? I get all these. <laughs> Premature scaling is the number one killer of startups. 65% of all failed startups have premature, uh, premature scaling is one of the reasons why they failed. What it is, is it's growing your company before you have traction, before you have product market fit. So as you're kind of figuring out and making this, this, this perfect product that customers absolutely love, you're going to have a lot of snags, you're going to have to figure out a lot of things and a bunch of different pivots. If you have a ton of customers at the time you hit those snags and need to make those pivots, that's going to ripple through the market it a much greater, with a much greater impact than you will if you had simply fewer customers you were getting that same feedback from. This goes back to the half full, half empty analogy. Um, the, the, the point is you, you want the right size container for the water. You want the right size of capital raise. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're not tempted to raise too much capital, that's going to help prevent premature scaling. These are famous examples of that premature scaling here. MySpace, they released nationwide, and so their servers were crashing all the time because too many people were signing up. 
Uh, Palm Pilot, a lot of the same. Atari was focusing on hardware rather than focusing on games, and Nintendo took them out of the market. Netscape was having a features war with Internet Explorer, with Microsoft, and they got completely wiped out by Chrome and by Firefox, who just said, well, how about we make it faster? And the market said, yeah, I like that better. Okay, so. good examples there. So this is the part of the presentation that our in-house counsel, Jill Buse, gets excited about. Um, Jill, can we skip the legal stuff here? <laughs> no. <laughs> so just a quick rundown. You can't just go out there and raise capital. Um, there are rules and regulations, laws, framework. They stem from the Great Depression era, the Securities Acts of 1933 and 1934, which are all about protecting the individual investor. Lots and lots of people lost everything in the crash of 29, and then some poor uh, uh, trade choices, including uh, led by a senator from Utah here, Reed Smoot, um, smoot holly Tara Act, if you've heard of that, helped exasperate uh, a, a, a downturn, an economic downturn, into the most serious uh, economic catastrophe of, of anyone's time, of, of uh, modern history. So the 34 Act created the SEC, Nothing to do with football. This is the Securities and Exchange Commission, an entity, a federal government entity you do not want to mess with. You'd rather get a call from the FBI than the SEC. They regulate the, the licensing, the, the selling of, of all securities, debt, equity, everything in between. Um, next. Uh, Full disclosure is a, is a huge part of uh, what the SEC requires in uh, securities regulation. Um, it, it applies to us here at RevRoad. So we raise capital internally and uh, through some uh, non-founders as well. And uh, we, we have this document. It's three or four pages, single space, of all of the, the, the risks, the disclosures that we could think of. Let me read you just one here that's kind of interesting. We may not achieve our projections and forecast skip a lot of this, for among other reasons, changes in existing and potential duties, tariffs, quotas, changes in relationships between the United States and foreign countries, including Russia, economic and political instability, countries or restrictive actions by the governments, foreign countries, changes in, in trade laws, tax laws, or both. We have companies uh, within our portfolio that manufacture overseas in China and the, the tariffs that are being imposed now are a tax on American consumers. When those, those goods come back to our shores, we have to pay more for them. Therefore, law of economics of supply and demand and pricing says that we will sell less of those. So that hurts. Um, there are exemptions to the securities uh, uh, regulations and laws that apply to startups. And these are fortunately there, they, they benefit startups when it comes time to raising capital, where you don't have to go through a very long, expensive, complicated process, hiring attorneys to, to help you do this. And those exemptions include, just for example, you've heard of uh, um, uh, like Reg A, Reg D, Rule 144. Some of these things allow you to raise a, a, a certain amount of capital at a cap and no more. And you can raise from um, what are called accredited investors. And that's very specifically defined as uh, a person that makes 200,000 or more a year or has a net worth of a million or more a year or a, a net worth of, of a million or more. Uh, also someone who is an insider or um, uh, has, has some role to play with the startup. You can raise money from all of those people and not have to worry about uh, registering with the SEC. Uh, there are blue skies law, the, the, the federal laws uh, from the acts of 33 and 34 replaced the blue sky laws. These are individual state laws. They're still out there. They still apply. You still need to know about them. You probably need a good securities attorney to walk you through that, that myriad. Um, one more word uh, uh, legally here. If you're friends with a, with a founder, with an entrepreneur, and he wants you to help raise capital, if you do that and you take a fee for that, and you are not a registered broker dealer with the SEC, um, you risk going to jail and a heavy fine. And so be, be careful there, but there are legal exemptions to that. Okay, we're just gonna finish up real fast here. 
Okay, so these are the type of the securities that we are talking about that are being issued. This is the institutional financing. So debt is pretty much what it sounds like. It's notes, loans, bonds. And the best part about them is they're very inexpensive comparative to uh, equity financing. Um, even if the interest rates are a little bit higher than the other ones, it's not gonna be as much as what, uh, what the stockholders are gonna be expecting or needing or will, will take as their, their part of the equity. Um, the downside is uh, you probably won't qualify for it. This is really hard to get as a startup. You need kind of a track record. Uh, you need assets that have been able to build up. You need a good credit score. Um, but I mean, the bottom line is uh, if you can qualify for it, it's the preferred method of funding a business. It's much more inexpensive. You don't have to answer to stockholders. So uh, do it if you can, but it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah, and so usually startups are not bankable, and since they're not, that's why you usually raise equity financing. You're giving up a part of your, your, uh, your company. Um, one of the pros there is you get a partner. You spread out the risk. You get additional help, and uh, it can be less expensive. It can also be more expensive. You can give up control. You have uh, regulatory uh, filings and uh, perhaps audits that you're, you're subject to. So pros and cons there with, with raising equity. Um, there are helpful partners on the equity side and there are not helpful partners. Be careful with that. So then we have these, these hybrid things. Uh, they're a little bit more current. This is a, li a lot more relevant to the startups we're looking at. Okay, So these are uh, convertible notes. They're a cross between debt and equity. Uh, KISS is typically a little bit more, uh, benefits the investor a little bit more. A SAFE typically benefits the startup a little bit more. But essentially, it's a way of raising money in a way, uh, raising money without immediately having a valuation of uh, your company. Yeah, and pros and cons of using these as well. We really like the SAFE. We've used the SAFE successfully with some of our portfolio companies, and we will again. And if you have any questions about that, I would uh, love to talk with you after. Uh, the bottom line is we think these are great tools to, to use. And you're going to have to go really fast through this. Okay, don't be afraid. Uh, this is another uh, graph I got from Brent Burtalk, and it looks terrible and awful and confusing. Um, let me just explain it real quick because it's really, really helpful. The, the um, y-axis there, that tells you what type of uh, company you are, whether you're a high growth, low growth, high tech or low tech. You know, if you're, it's a, an existing product in an existing market, you're going to be on the, the bottom half. If it's a newer one or a highly scalable product, it's going to be in the top half. And then the bottom one, that is startup to a mature company. So where you are in the phase of your company, this tells you what kind of funding will be available to you, right? So on the top half, we have a lot of equity financing that's available. If you're a little bit more mature, that little red box at the top, those are unicorns, right? Those are people that, that get really, uh, really early, start up really, really quickly. On the bottom, it's a lot more debt financing and that sort of thing. Um, where SBA loans fit in with everything else versus institutional um, or, or just other types of financing as they go. So we can make these uh, slides available um, so you can have access to this, but it's actually uh, incredibly helpful as far as determining who and where you should be going to find uh, kind of later stage or, or to try the to, to try to find that funding wherever you're at. So in summary, the magic word for raising capital is get traction. And uh, the best form of traction is revenue, but there are precursors to revenue, which you can also get. How do you get revenue without, without capital? Rely on yourself. Rely on your network, your, your, your personal network. There are resources there. As June Jordan said, we are the ones you, that we've been waiting for. We can, we can do this as, as this uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem coalesces here in Utah Valley. Thank you. Are there any questions or anything that uh, I mean, people are, are interested about or have questions about your specific situation? We can probably we'll take a to, few. We'll, we'll, we'll probably have to take questions uh, after, after yeah. lunch or during okay. lunch. Yep. Thank you. Hey, great job. Sure appreciate uh, Seth and Bart sharing that. <laughs> You can see, you can see why, why we value them so much and appreciate the contributions that they make to the 15 companies that are today a part of RevRoad. And we're so excited about what they'll do to the companies to help them grow that are um, currently in that group and those that are joining that group along the way. So uh, thrilled for that. And as they've pointed out, they'll be happy to take questions after. 
These presentations, these workshops are always available for you on RevRoad's website, and we encourage you to visit there as frequently as you'd like to access those.